All right, it is 2.30. So welcome everyone to this session. Uh, before we get started, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and the time you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others, and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. So I'll hand it over to Yang now, and the presenters may now begin. Thank you, Sean. So hi, everyone. Um, I'll just start by sharing my the presentation slide I created for the uh, uh, panel. Okay, uh, can you all see the, uh, the slide? We're on a presenter view. Okay. Uh, sorry. Just, uh, how about now? Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, today our panel presentation is about open textbook writing as a tool of teaching. Uh, we're a group of uh, faculty who have taught using, and uh, of course, one student who have either taught using this support, uh, approach, supported uh, faculty using this approach, or been actually a, a participant in a class using this approach. And we'd like through our panel discussion to offer some tips and tools for beginners who would like to um, use this uh, practice in their uh, teaching. So about us, we're a group from Clemson University in South Carolina. Uh, my name is Yang Wu. I'm the Open Resources Librarian at Clemson Libraries, and I'll have the rest of my panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Mary Kate Fiddler. Uh, I am a lecturer in Earth Sciences. Hi, I'm Becky Tugman, and I'm a lecturer in Public Health Science. Hi, I'm Drew Belsha. I'm a recent graduate of a health science program at Clemson. Uh, thank you, everyone. So before we get started, um, I'd like to, uh, some of you might already know what student open textbook writing is, but in case uh, some of you don't, I'd just like to give a brief summary of it. Um, it is basically this. It is a practice of teaching where students collectively write, edit, and publish an online textbook or an open education uh, or educational resource related to the class uh, subject. It uses web publishing and the use of online web publishing tools as a way of teaching students research and information literacy. And it's a creative alternative to class projects like the paper, the term paper and other things. Um, this is a way to stimulate creative teaching and also to st uh, stimulate cr student creativity. It's also kind of a part of that new um, trend influenced by constructivism and other things to get students to really uh, draw connections between what they're learning in class and real life and to create something um, that they feel has lasting value. And unlike a term paper, this is something that the student can say, you know, this is a part of my larger work. I can show it on my CV. And it's something that has a lasting impact on students, something that students could show to others. And it's not like a term paper that's basically disposable. Um, it's only being, it's, it would only be seen by an instructor. And it's basically valueless uh, to the student after a grade has been given on that. So students learn a lot of uh, real life skills um, by through this process and connecting the core subjects to a lot of real life matters um, by writing something that's really, that could be seen by a lot of people. Um, they learn skills such as how to write for a public audience and how do you determine what audience you want to write for um, and how do you uh, control the way you write in terms of vocabulary and other things so that it can be understandable by a public audience. Students also learn uh, copyright because a lot of students are information generators. They post videos on social media and other things, but do they know copyright? 
Um, students also learn uh, to make creative uses of online uh, platforms for publishing. And for our um, teaching using student open textbook writing, we taught students how to use uh, press books. And lastly, students learn um, editing, um, how they work together to determine how do I make this a professional quality work, which is something that's useful for improving the writing skills as well. Um, we'd like to primarily talk about kind of our experiences teaching using this approach in the last year, which was during the COVID pandemic. But now COVID seemingly is going away. And also, um, uh, some of us have also um, taught uh, using the approach prior to COVID as well. So we like to talk about our broader experiences with this approach. Um, and we like to talk about our courses. Um, what we found out is that teaching using this open textbook writing approach um, is something that really that can be applicable to a lot of courses for higher and lower level students, um, as long as they're within a certain size and they support a lot of uh, student research and um, writing. And um, we found that this approach works well if there, it can be um, slowly integrated uh, into the course through a number of smaller assignments where the students gradually learn skills on how to finalize a, um, uh, uh, something that's going to be published online. So to, uh, we'd like to introduce our courses and how we integrated this assignment into the course and to give you some um, uh, outcomes that we produced. Uh, first, uh, can we have um, uh, Mary Kate? Would you like to go first and introduce your course, um, the way you integrated the assignment in your course, and um, your uh, book that was produced in the end? Absolutely. Uh, so I used this textbook writing project in a new class that I had never taught before, called Science Technology in Society. So this is a pretty broad topic for a course in the class we delve into all of the a variety of different ways that science and technology both shape society and society shapes advancements in technology and, and science. Um, this course was a general education course at Clemson. It fulfilled two general education competencies, one in science, technology, and society, and the other in humanities. Um, because this was a humanities course, it has to include a significant writing component for the students. So when I heard of this open textbook project, I thought this is a great opportunity to have them write something, right? To really focus on learning about writing uh, in a way that can be shared publicly and created collaboratively. So the course was around 35 students and it consisted of all grade levels being a general education course. Uh, and all different majors and all different levels of experience writing. Um, so the way that I incorporated the project into the course was through a series of steps. And there were some, I wanted to basically have this project make up about 50% of the course content. So we focused this in the second half of the semester. So when we were ready to turn to building our textbook, we started with choosing a topic and section topics within the textbook. So I really allowed the students to pursue their own individual interests through a large class discussion. They chose subtopics within the general field of science, technology, and society that interested them. And then we chose a textbook larger topical theme that could include all of those section topics. Dividing the students into sections ended up being really helpful throughout the project because it was these built-in teams that they could work together in smaller groups on every step of the way. After we had our topics, our next discussions focused on agreeing on elements that the students wanted to include in their textbooks. Did they want to include review questions at the end of chapters, keywords, um, what writing style did they want to use, and what audience did they want to be writing to for? Um, and so this group discussion was really fruitful. Next step was to begin the research on their individual chapter topics. So each student was writing a chapter individually here. And to help guide them on their research journey, we created annotated bibliographies 
uh, and focused on some instruction on effective use of search engines to get good sources of information for their, for their chapters. The next step along the way was then to think about the images that they would include in their textbooks. Everyone agreed unanimously back in step two here that images were really important in the chap in, in any textbook. So part of choosing images for their textbooks was discussions of copyright. Uh, and we had the support of Dr. Wu to teach the students about copyright and how to properly cite all of the images used and what images were available to them. Uh, next, before they started their writing, we talked about a thesis statement for their chapters. So they had some instruction on crafting effective thesis statements that help them give their writing more direction and purpose and focus. Now they've done their research, they've created a, a thesis, a path that they really, how they wanna communicate this information and what they wanna focus on. The next step was oral presentations. And this was really useful step, I think, for the students. We used VoiceThread as a way to create oral presentations in the hybrid slash online class setting. Uh, which allows students to comment on each other's work uh, and provide peer feedback in that way. Then we got into writing and with a few different drafts, uh, eventually uh, with peer editing along the way, eventually students had their written chapters. Um, and then lastly, to tie all of our textbook sections and these individual chapters together in their small groups on like topical sections within the textbook, the students wrote introductions and summaries um, for their textbook section. And I just wanna stress that peer editing was used on really every step of this process, whether it was peer editing or group discussions, they were getting feedback from their peers every step of the way. So this is the book that we produced. You can visit it here uh, at the domain listed. Uh, the title of our textbook is Global Science and Technology Challenges of the 21st Century. As students picked their topics, uh, they were really interested in the science and technology challenges that humanity was grappling with in the now. Um, so they chose uh, these five sections to include under this theme, artificial intelligence, global climate change, privacy and technology, the coronavirus pandemic and advancement of medical technology. Uh, thank you. Um, so we have the next uh, books. Um, uh, Becky and Drew, could you please uh, uh, discuss your books, uh, the way you've integrated and your roles in the course? These two courses are upper level courses for public health science students. We have three majors in our um, division and one is pre-professional, those that want to go on to either med school or PT, OT. We have those that want to do health promotion and then our final um, area is healthcare administration. So any of the students can take these courses um, but the majority are those that are in the pre-professional track. Each class had 25 students. Um, they could decide once they got in, I started out day one saying, we're gonna write a textbook. And we had some weird looks, uh, but it was an idea that this is what the class needed to be around. And I got this idea from speaking with Dr. Wu. He put out a lot of information on Clemson about open, resources education. And so I went and spoke with him and he's like, have you thought of ever doing a textbook? And I was like, I don't know about that. And he said, other people are doing it and you, it allows your class to have a lot of freedom on what you wanna talk about. And so since these two courses, one was eating disorders and obesity and the other one was men's health, those are such big topics that I thought this might be a really cool class project. So I'll let Drew tell a little bit about her perception. I really enjoyed the whole process throughout both classes. I was a part of both textbooks. Um, like she said, these were such large topics. I was wondering how we were going to learn all about these things, but I thought the textbook was a great way to learn it. 
just because all of us took a piece that we were really interested in and we created a product of it. And it was just amazing to peer edit and to learn from my peers. It was a very student driven class and I'd never been a part of that before. And so it was very exciting to learn what I wanted to learn for the first time. So we did ours similar to Mary Kate, but a little different. We started out the first week or so of class talking about the big picture of these health issues. What are the biggest um, obstacles with obesity? What are the biggest dangers of eating disorder? What are the challenges for men's health? And so we, I gave them a big overview. From that, they were supposed to pick a few topics that they thought might be interesting. So after they selected a, two, a few, they narrowed it down to a 30 to 60 second elevator speech. And the elevator speech was, why do you think the public needs to know about this and what would it be important? So they each picked a topic. As they were doing it, they filled out a Google form to say, yes, whether they liked the topic, how they thought it might um, impact the general audience and how we could use this for a book. So after all of that came together, we shared all of the feedback that they gave each other and we decided, okay, what is our target audience? Who, who needs to know this information? And how are we going to group this information to make um, sure it makes sense? So what is our theme? Both times it was a complete class discussion. It was a lot of voting. It was a lot of, you know, I like this, I don't like this. And so finally, we all came to a consensus. At that point, they were all going to do a chapter draft. Now, the chapters we made were equivalent to a two or a three page paper. We put a word limit on it. That way, the length of the, each chapter would be consistent. And they wrote that first chapter draft. Then I gave feedback, Beers gave feedback, and then we went on to second, third, fourth. And each time, the, each chapter draft had a different um, duties. One was bringing in images. Others was finding words that were age appropriate for what our writing level, um, doing glossary terms, different things like that. So they had little jobs to do with each chapter. Then after, they, after the second or third, they decided Everybody reads everybody's chapter. And in the process, they create chapter questions out of it. And this was also another way to give feedback. They also created an infographic to summarize key points of their chapter. And both were added to the end. One more revision, then they all came back together and were given an editing duty. Whether the editing duty had to do with spacing, whether it had to do with in-text citation, whether it had to do with attributions of images, they all had a duty till the final product, which was done even a little bit after finals was over because we still had people tweaking. That's when we decided to publish once we felt comfortable with everybody's sections. Drew, do you wanna add anything to that process? I thought the process worked great. I did enjoy every step. I thought the elevator topic or elevator speech was a great way to kick it off just so we could see where our peers were thinking of heading with the project. And also it gave us an idea when we were first starting to research if we could write something on that topic. I know I changed my topic for the first book um, in the eating and obesity disorders book that from my elevator speech once I just started like diving into the research part of it. So I think that's a great way to just kind of see where your head's at, where, what you're interested in and then kick off your research from there. And so these are our two books produced. The first one is the Ecological Approach to Obesity and Eating Disorders, uh, which looks at all of the different levels that eating disorders and obesity is not just an individual problem, but there are community and other outside factors that go into this. And then the second book, the theme was more a guy's guide, trying to get those 20 and 30 year olds to realize that men's health, they need to know this information because they need to seek help 
because usually men wait until it's too late to go to the doctor. So that was their advice of how and when to go get help. Oh, and thank you. And so um, supporting the creation of the, these books required a lot of logistics. And as uh, Mary Kate mentioned earlier, um, I gave um, lectures to students in both classes uh, about uh, copyright issues and also about how to use press books and the structure of the textbooks. So now we move on to the, our discussion and panel. Um, our panel is divided into two parts. The first is a reflective discussion of some of the issues we've, uh, met, uh, we met on the, uh, on the, over the course of uh, this uh, open textbook uh, writing, and also some of our experiences. And then we'll move on to discussion with uh, your questions. So to start the first part, we have four questions. The first question um, is for us is, what was your impression of the first time you taught using this method um, or was in a class taught using this method? Uh, Mary, can, uh, can you start off? Absolutely. So I used this project, this textbook writing project for the first time in a course that I was teaching for the first time. Um, and I was attracted to using the project for two main reasons. One, that it allowed student learning to make up, like student directed learning to make up a big chunk of the course. And I figured that this was great for the students and this was great for me. Um, science, technology and society studies is not my area of expertise. I'm an earth scientist. So although I'm a type of scientist, this course was new to me. And so I was really excited about the idea of the students being able to pursue their own interests and direct the learning for about half the course by doing this project. Um, so that was a win-win in my book. And I also was attracted to doing this project because I figured it would lend itself pretty well to remote instruction. I taught this course in fall 2020, and though the course was offered as a hybrid course, of my 35 students, I typically would have one or two attend in person um, for the first half of the semester, and then they started attending online too. So it really ended up functioning more like a fully online course. And the open textbook writing is pretty easy to do in an online remote setting, I found, because the peer editing, like basically there's portions of the assignment that are very individual. And then all of the collaborative work, the peer editing, the group discussions, the deciding on things to create this textbook could be done pretty easily in Zoom breakout rooms, organized on Google Docs, oral presentations could be done on uh, you know, an online presentation platform like VoiceThread, where students could give each other feedback really easily. And so it worked really well for that. Um, and I think, I think, as I mentioned before, creating subsections within the textbook was a really good way to divide my 35 person class into teams that could work together all throughout the course, uh, which I found really useful for an online class to break down the large class size into smaller groups to create more cohesion and collaboration within the class ended up being really important. Um, so that just lent itself really well um, to the style of teaching that I was doing. And I also think that this project, you know, it worked great in the online setting, but it will also work just as well in an in-person classroom. So I'm excited to transition the project back to an in-person class this fall at Clemson. Um, so my overall impressions after using this method were really positive uh, that the students seemed excited about what they were doing and they wrote quality work and I was particularly impressed by the quality of their peer editing. And I tried hard to foster a positive environment for peer editing um, throughout the course and I think that it worked in this case. My impression at first was, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, uh, to be 100% honest. So we just took it step by step, the class and I, we figured this out together. We decided, okay, based on those steps, where do we need to go next? Um, luckily, uh, Dr. Wu and another person in the libraries had also done this methodology. So they gave me some tips on what had worked for them. But the great part of this is because it was so new, we as a class figured it out. The students had as much input 
and ideas of where we wanted to go with this. And we started out in the spring of 2020. So we were in person until March and then COVID hit and it was completely online or just messaging. But with it, because there is so many individual parts, the students were able to continue to work the whole entire time. So COVID upset them in all of the other ways, but this class, it actually just kept going. And so that was nice to have a method that was so fluid and allowed you to go with what the times were doing. I'm sure Drew may have a different opinion, but. So when I first found out that we were writing a textbook for the course, I was definitely a little nervous because like Dr. Wu said, most of my writing previously had been just essays or a literature review or something that only my teacher was going to read. But this was actually going to be a published piece for an audience and the general public and to learn from. Um, breaking it down into the baby steps, so definitely helped and it just made it way more manageable. I liked talking with my class and communicating with them on creating this product together where we could be teaching, especially in our major of health science, we all advocate for health. And so we really enjoyed that. And even though we all came from different backgrounds of health promotion, pre-professional health students and admin, we were able to create a product from this and all of our ideas. Um, like Ms. Tugman said, um, COVID like did not affect our kind of movement with the textbook. All my other classes, I had a huge transition of going to online learning, but this transitioned seamlessly because we were still able to communic communicate online and work on press books online together and be editing. So it was no issue at all. So thank you. Our second question is, what changed in your approach to writing the textbook from the first book to the second? The biggest change that I had, we kept all of the assignments the same. And the first day I explained those assignments and Drew chimed in with a few other um, students that came in from my 4150 class into my men's health class and just get, shared their experience. So I think with this, having somebody gone through the process made this year's class more at ease. I didn't have anybody drop. The first semester I had people drop, but we were an in-person class, which was rare as far as what was happening at the university level in spring of 21. So all everybody was there, even though we logistically had some I wouldn't say difficulties, but challenges with people being in line and being in another room. But we just pretty much took the same steps. One thing I changed that I didn't do the first time is the amount of feedback that I gave and the amount of feedback that I promoted the students to give. Because Dr. Wu uh, did a survey after our first textbook for um, the eating disorders textbook. And the students loved the feedback. And they'd actually said getting feedback from my peers was so rewarding compared to just getting it from a professor alone. So I really upped the amount of feedback, encouraged them to do more feedback. And if they had questions, instead of me taking the time to try to make them figure it out, I would say, okay, let's bring in this student and this student because they've got the same issue and let's work through it as a team. So we did it more as a team approach. I agree that we did change it a little bit more, just more feedback in the second time, which I definitely appreciated more. I felt like my writing in the second textbook was a lot more focused on our goal and our topic idea of the textbook. Um, I was also writing more focused on writing at that general population level um, that was more appropriate for our audience. I think the feedback also helped with that to make sure I wasn't leaving in any too big like medical terminologies that wouldn't be understood or anything like that. Um, that definitely helped. So, yeah. And thank you, Drew. So our third question is, and for it's for all three panelists, how did you get students to buy into the idea? Uh, Drew, since you are the student in the class, uh, could you please begin first? 
So like I said before, I was definitely overwhelmed when I first found out I'd be writing a textbook. I had never written a piece of anything that was going to be intended for education purposes to other people. Um, but in my career field, that is what I'm going to have to do. So I thought it was a great opportunity to learn how to do it in college. Um, I was very excited because I was able to choose a topic that I was actually interested in learning about within the bigger realm of men's health and eating disorders and obesity. Um, so I was able to focus my research. It was also a great time to figure out how to research and the best way to research using annot annotated bibliographies and learning about copyright from Dr. Wu. So I could use those skills later on in my career and my path to graduate school and beyond. Besides telling them they would lead the class and it would be a student-centered learning opportunity, I also stress this is a great thing to put on a resume. And if you have an interview, you can talk about this process. So. I have written letters of recommendations for several students that were in these courses, and it was really good to talk about their book and then to put the link to their individual chapter and look at what this person can produce. This is why you want to consider this person for your professional program or for this job. Also, it gave them another opportunity to be creative. I feel that creativity is sometimes not always allowed in some classes, especially when it's health because there's just disease and it happens. So this gave them a way to show more of a creative side. And those that weren't creative, they had a lot of help from others that were. So uh, the teamwork in it really was a benefit. And I tried to stress that when we were talking about doing the book. I also agree on the being great for resumes and everything. I've already had job applications and interviews and stuff like that. And I'm preparing for grad school applications. And all my mentors have said that this is a great piece to have. Um, and they love to hear about it. They love to hear what my topic was and to go in depth more so they can see that I have done research in this field. And I would, I agree with everything that Drew and Becky have said and tried to say similar things to my classes. The last moment, I think, in my instruction that I didn't even expect to create a lot of buy-in, but really did, was when we had a discussion as a class on what made a textbook effective, what made a textbook an easy resource to learn from. And I just kind of realized that those students have never written a textbook before. They've read a lot of them. And they had all sorts of ideas and opinions and uh, of how they have learned from textbooks in the past. And they got really excited about combining the most effective elements from textbooks that they've used to create a textbook themselves that they thought would help, would, would be an effective teaching tool. Um, like doing better than maybe bad textbooks that they had used before in their lives um, actually created a lot of buy-in for them too. Uh, thank you. And the last question is, um, what did you find most challenging about this form of teaching, uh, whether you taught it as a gen ed class or as a focused major course? Uh, Mary Kay, can you start us off? Yeah. So one thing that was a bit challenging was for my general education course, the variety of different levels of writing um, ability and engagement within the course. Um, so this was definitely a challenge. I didn't know exactly how I was going to bridge this challenge, but I think that the peer work and the group work was really the most effective way to bring everyone, to bring the quality of the textbook product up to a high level for all the students. Um, the students were in groups within their sections that they worked together on, mostly for their peer editing processes, um, Etc., cetera, and, and organizing their chunk of the textbook uh, into something that they could be proud of. And I really encouraged them to not hold back on the feedback, right? To positive feedback, positive criticism, negative criticism, it's all part of the process. And so within those teams, they could create an environment where the older, more ex students that had more experience with writing 
could really help the students that were younger and had less experience with writing. Um, and so that was really positive. And of course, it also I think that Drew spoke to this, that's kind of an overwhelming task to think about writing a textbook and that felt like a big challenge. Uh, we've spoken about this a little bit, but breaking it down into smaller steps was critical. Um, and, you know, I was worried going into this project because I'd never used press books, but it turns out it's pretty easy to use <laughs> and the students could figure it out just as fast as I could. Um, and especially with some support from Dr. Wu, we didn't have a problem with that in the end. So one of the biggest challenges I felt my students struggled with is writing to the appropriate grade level. Because most um, for general audience, they say is between seventh and ninth grade reading level. So we found out how do you judge, you take a paragraph and you count the syllables and that can determine a reading level. Well, a lot of my students were very used to writing in a very high language. And so for them to take words and put it down was a big challenge for them. And a lot of times, you know, one, like for example, one person said energy expenditure. I was just like calories. So it's just making it into those layman terms, which is all, something they all need to learn if they're going to teach health to the general public. Another challenge that we had, or that I had personally, is because I let them pick all the topics. So throughout the semester, the book was our major project, but there were days where I would bring in supplemental information. So not having a syllabus at the beginning of the semester to say we're gonna cover X, Y, Z was a little bit challenging because I didn't know what I was covering until I saw all their topics for the book because I didn't wanna take time lecturing and doing projects or little in-class activities on something that was going to be covered in somebody's chapter. So you have to be flexible. If you're going to teach this, you have to be flexible because that's the only way you can make it flow. Uh, during this project and a focus major class, I felt like it was a little bit challenging that sometimes our, myself and my peers, we felt like we had very strong opinions on how the textbook should go. Um, so like we discussed earlier, there was a lot of voting and class discussions, but it ended up all smoothing out in the process and we all like compromised and reached an agreement, which I think was a great way to start the process of the textbook was to just be open about what we were expecting, what we were wanting in the textbook. Um, another challenging thing was probably learning all the copy, copyright and like uh, Becky was saying, how we had to bring down the language of the textbook. Um, most of us are used, used to writing lab reports and everything where we used to use the most technical terms, but now we were having to write in common language. Um, so again, leaning on our peers to help figure out how to make it more readable for the general public was a great experience. And thank you. Uh, so now we open um, our discussion to your questions. Um, we'll let your questions um, let you either, if you uh, speak out directly, if you can, or just to uh, put your questions in chat. So feel free to speak to us uh, any questions you have, and of course, uh, to ask any of us about our experiences. Um, one thing I wanted to add is that, um, as uh, was mentioned by Drew and of course, uh, Becky and Mary Kate, um, one challenge uh, in providing kind of the logistics for the course is to create um, assignment, uh, to resources and assignments that can, students can keep on referring to about copyright matters and that can test them. Um, I found that sim a simple a discussion, a lecture is probably um, not enough. And it's probably good to create videos or some other information or interactive uh, questions that students can consult again. Um, so uh, uh, Sherry has a question. Has anyone's book uh, been adopted for a class? Um, 
that would mean what we would want to do for kind of future courses. Um, I'll let the panelists decide, um, uh, do you plan to use this book um, as a form of like um, teaching for your future courses, for example, letting students see it as a guide uh, for creating their book or to make any edits to it? Yeah, I will certainly, at the very minimum, be using this textbook for my next class to see as a guide. Um, but I think that I'll probably be assigning readings from this textbook that the students wrote last year um, to my same course that I'm teaching this fall. Um, as I mentioned, I broke my class up into two halves. With the first half, I presented a lot more content in science, technology, and society. They did more standard assignments, and then we shifted to this textbook writing in the second half. So I'm planning on incorporating readings from the student written work from last year into that first half, where we are, I'm kind of choosing what science, technology, society issues I want them to be, start thinking about to get the wheels turning. Um, Becky, would you like to add in as well? Our, our book was meant for the general public. I put them out on open forums where anybody can look at them. So I don't know who looks at them because it's just on the web. So anybody who has the link can look at it. But we did do one assignment this year where they went and read somebody's from last semesters just to get a feel of how they put them together. And then they made comments on what they liked and what they didn't like about that chapter and how we can learn from them. So. It was just a minimal assignment. Um, and then, but right now I can't envision it being a course textbook uh, because it's meant for the general audience. Uh, thank you. And so Jeff has another question. Um, how do you manage uh, your pro project if something's taking longer than planned or might be unfinished at the end of the semester? We had designated due dates, and uh, Drew may speak to this a little bit more, but because we broke it up in such little pieces, I didn't really feel there was ever anybody behind because they were very focused. They had just small chunks to do each time. And the only thing that went a little long is we were still doing some minor edits after finals was over, but the students that wanted those edits, they were okay with helping out, but it never, I never had a problem with students getting behind. Yeah, having the due dates and breaking it up into smaller chunks, like having our elevator speeches first, then annotated bibliographies of research, then our first draft of the chapter and having those specific due dates helped me manage my time because that's the biggest thing in college is time management. And I liked being able to kind of work at my own pace, even within those due dates. Um, I never felt behind in it. I enjoyed editing all the way up through the end of the book process. So that's how I felt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And we'll move on to the next question from Angela, um, who mentioned, how did you all decide on press books? And is it provided by the campus? And I'll uh, answer this question. Uh, we actually decided on Pressbooks because it's a simple system. It's very easy to use. Um, it's um, something like a word processor, but with kind of advanced online publishing fun functions. Um, the advantage of uh, Pressbooks is that it initially wasn't actually provided by campus, but we used um, uh, the $99 publishing, uh, self-publishing Pressbook. Where um, you only need to pay uh, around ninety-nine dollars to write and publish a book, and that's something that departments, um, the libraries, and other places can easily um, afford. Um, the thing is, um, uh, when we started to use press books more and more, there was sort of a ballooning effect. In fact, um, two of uh, Becky's colleagues um, uh, in the next semester after uh, she completed her first book uh, came to me and just said, "You know." We had some students from Becky's course who are interested in this, really interested in this approach. So in our course, when we decided to have a class project, they just suggested this. So more and more people started using Pressbooks and our institution eventually got a, um, a subscription copy of Pressbooks, we're, which we're going to use uh, for the next semester. But there's also lots of um, like uh, open source uh, 
uh, publishing software for this as well. Uh, for example, uh, if anyone's heard of Scalar, S-C-A-L-A-R, that's a open source uh, online publishing software that you can download. Uh, it might take, you might have to get one of your IT people to do some work on it, just to get everyone familiarized it. But it's something that can be used to create um, open textbooks uh, for free. And there's also other alternatives that are even lower cost than uh, press books, such as Git books and other things. Um, so there's many alternatives you can use at your institution. And if anyone's interested, I can send a list of these books. Um, so, uh, yes. Oh, to I'm add to that, um, I'll let Drew speak, but the students, press books didn't take, I had no experience in it. And so as a class, we just tried it all at once. And so they figured it out before I figured it out. So Drew, do you wanna talk about how easy press books or difficult it is to use? Yeah, I felt like it was pretty easy. Um, it definitely takes a little bit of practice in the beginning. I was a little hesitant about how to work everything. Um, I know we all kind of typed up in a Word document first just to submit our first drafts easier on like a canvas and everything. But after that, we were all working in press books mainly. Um, I like that we were able to still view each other's chapters within press books. It was a lot easier than sending documents back and forth over emails and stuff like that. So Pressbooks make that very easy. Um, it's super easy to use like divine glossary terms and create a glossary within Pressbooks. And that second time around in the textbook, I felt way more confident using Pressbooks um, and figuring out all those little things of adding indents, adding subheadings, adding other text boxes like for our chapter review questions and stuff, stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions from the audience? I actually have one for you all. Um, do you think there's an upper limit on the number of students that can be involved in this kind of project in a course? And do you have a sense of what that limit might be? Maybe just for you personally, Eva. That's a great question. Um, my class size was about 35 and that felt to me like maybe I could go up to 40 students working on a single book, but I think more than that might feel challenging. But even at a class size of like 35, 36, I considered dividing the class and making two textbooks within the course where, you know, if I had a larger class size, I think that I could definitely do this project and just create multiple textbooks with different students working on each one. I think that that would run smoothly, though I haven't done it yet. From a peer standpoint and being in the class, I definitely feel like probably 20 to 40 students is best just because there's so many opinions and so many like little decisions that carry your textbook a long way and everybody's writing to make it cohesive and go together. That if there's too many opinions and people are not agreeing on it or just have different writing styles, it's just not gonna be a very cohesive textbook. And it depends as a professor how much you are hands-on. Um, I read everybody's chapter three, four times at least. And so the grading amount is very high. I required every one of my students to read each other's chapters. So again, how much time does that take and how much time do you give them away from class because to read 40 other chapters, yes, they read that for books and other things, but to edit and give feedback is, can be quite a bit. So you, you need to be cognizant of your ability and your time, as well as what you would require of your students. And like Drew said, if you get too many opinions, is your book gonna flow? And so therefore you want to make sure that you do have that flow piece with whatever you're trying to do. True. And in my course, I didn't have every student read every chapter because at 35 chapters, that seemed like too much. <laughs> um, but I had every student read every chapter within their section, like every student read about 10 chapters from the book. And so I just made sure that each person had X number of students reading their work and giving them feedbacks. Um, and the reason I had them write or read every chapter is because there was my content for my course. Yeah. So they learned about the health issues that everybody else was talking about. So that's how I got the content 
for my course in where Mary Kate did content at the beginning. That was my content. So that's why, again, and Drew can say, you know, what she remembers from other people's chapters, because reading them two or three times and thinking about them and asking questions, you're thinking deeper and it allows for metacognition about the learning. So that's where that benefit of having those smaller numbers may come into help. I would definitely say the material that I learned from these two classes writing the textbook, I probably learned more material here than a lot of my other classes. And it probably was because I was so engaged with my peers and reading so much and looking into their topics as well. So I was able to actually learn it and retain it. And now I'm using it even in working in the medical field now. Well, thank you all so much. We are at 321 now, so I want to be respectful of all our times here and give us that break between the next session. Um, but again, thank you all so much for just a fantastic panel. I feel like I learned an enormous amount. Uh, we're going to close the recording in the room here. Thank you all. Thank you very much.